So I'm joined this morning by uh, Yolanda Nardizzi. Um, she's living in Australia and she has uh, not far from a dairy woman that has been on this channel and has been supporting the renewal of the faith. And um, why am I interviewing Yolanda? Well, last week, people remember I spoke about Father Gobi and uh I am trying to find out more about this interesting, amazing priest. And Yolanda happened to have met him just a few times. And uh, you speak Italian, Yolanda. And I was wondering, yeah. I'm going to let you speak for a little bit. Can you tell us about your the history, how you knew Father Gobi, a little bit about his life and so forth? Okay. Well, firstly, I think one gets conscripted in Our Lady's Army, not necessarily voluntarily. It seems I certainly wasn't looking to meet a Father Gobi. I'd been a lay missionary in the highlands of New Guinea, one of the very the eighth white Caucasian woman. And a Capuchin priest that I had met before the missions, I went because of him, later became a bishop, sent me the first booklet of Father Gobi's locutions. There was probably about 10 pages to the booklet. And oddly enough, he said to me, he's coming through Perth. I know you love Fatima and you might be interested to know, to go and see him. So he gave me the name of a nun here, Brigidine nun, who was allegedly hosting Father Gobby. I rang her and she said, I, my brother is a priest in Sydney. He's bringing some Italian priest. I have no idea who he is. So she gave me his number. He was in Hurstville, Sydney. So I called him, bless him, Father Ma. And he said to me, oh, I'm glad you rang. I'm a contemporary of the late Archbishop Goody in Perth. I'm a contemporary of his. He's going to the Synod in 1980. And he's welcomed Father Gobby to Perth. But I have no one to organise anything. And would you be my organiser? I said, hey, Father, take it easy here. <laughs> so anyway... I involuntarily volunteered. I never knew what I was getting myself into. And no regrets, of course. And sure enough, Father Ma did arrive with Father Gobby in 1980. So that was indirectly how I was called. And since then, I've had many physical contacts with Father Gobby, at least 10 over the last many years that I knew him from 1980, as I took a lot of pilgrimages to Europe. And above all, I was on a monthly phone call with him, wherever he was in the world. And having said that, he was probably, and I have no doubt about this, the most travelled priest in the history of the Catholic Church. Hmm. He went through 39 passports, and one of the priests decided to write the agenda of all his flights, and it's actually in a booklet. So 39 passports, there's no country he hasn't touched. And the book is translated in 37 languages, which is in itself quite miraculous. So that's the origins, how I met him. That is quite amazing. Uh, 39 passports, I, I think I've been through, uh, and that's because you have to renew them every 10 years, three. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, that's, and that's really uh, something quite remarkable. I suppose a lot of people have been um, commenting on him that this book that he was censored and there's been many many different views on it what is the status of the blue book today do you know where where are we in the church with uh, those those writings that he wrote well i think primarily it's not the prophetic vision of the book father gobby would not have wanted that mm. primarily the function of the book I think what happens in our Catholic Church, and I've been blessed by my heritage to be a cradle Catholic, very blessed. I think we have spiritual anemia that happens every cycle. Mm -hmm. It certainly happened with St. Francis and other times. And I think the Holy Spirit comes along to fill the gap of a spiritual anemia. Now, it's a great coincidence or God incident that in 1972, exactly on the feast of Peter and Paul, the late St. Paul VI, Pope Paul VI, came out openly in 1972 
and said by some mysterious crack, the smoke of Satan has entered into the Vatican. Well, just like parenthesis, Our Lady on the 8th of May, there is Father Gobby, a priest from Milan, who was teaching at a Catholic Lyceum, a late vocation, a twin, was there at the Chapel of Fatima, and he overheard a group of dissident priests who were trying to form some sort of a union against the church. He was quite horrified. And he received what we know today to be perceived as an inner locution. Now, I've personally asked him, what is this inner locution? We know it now. Many, many priests, many saints seem to have had the same gift. It's not a visual apparition in any way. It's an interior perception in his own heart. It's not auricular. It's actually perceived in his heart. He gets some almost like a beep calling, if I could call it that, and he synchronises pen to paper. And as you saw in these messages, it simply flows as perfect prose. Mm. Unlike perhaps experiences in the charismatic renewal that people have where someone gets a word of knowledge and then they get two or three phrases and somebody interprets the phrases. There's none of that. There's volumes of this that he writes. Some oral messages that he's had over the time, and they're actually listed at the top of the book if they're given verbally, orally. I have a recording of one of his locutions that was taken at a, a retreat in Colli Valenza. The locution lasted almost 22 minutes without a break and perfect praise. Prose, sorry, perfect prose. No, um, uh, stop, start. The difference is that his voice went very monotone because he speaks very, very fast. He's not easy to translate with. He speaks very fast, but in the case of the locution, he spoke extremely slowly and it was almost a monotone of speaking. So much so that if you asked him to repeat it, he wouldn't be able to. That makes sense? Yeah. And I can give you a classic example. Father Gobby only ever went once to Medjugorje. And that was not because he was being disobedient in any way. He was asked by the Archbishop of Split to come and give a main conference. And between Split and Dubrovnik, he stopped in transit at Medjugorje. Now, some books have that message and some haven't. But he told me of a story that happened there, and this is classically what I'm talking about. He was taken by the main parish priest and another Italian priest, Father Dino, to visit a wonderful woman who was looking after the most rejected children of Croatia. I mean, deformed and highly rejected. And her name was Helen. And Father Gobby, one thing about him, he never handles money. He passes the money on for the publication of the books. If money for masses are given, they're collected and given at his retreat to poorer countries that may need those mass offerings to help with expenses and so forth. So he, Our Lady had certainly formed him in the spirit of great poverty. But oddly enough, in, in Medjugorje, some American neurologist was there and he gave him a roll of US dollars formed like a cigarette, you know, just quite a lot. He had no idea what they were. And under the circumstances, he put them in his deep pockets. He always wore a satan. That was out of reparation, by the way, after he became called by a lady. He wore the black satan everywhere, which wasn't very pleasant on the equator and in hot countries, but he did that as an act of reparation. And when he was taken to see this woman, she had a beautiful icon uh, in this, it was like a cave. The hospital was very isolated. People don't even know that it's there. And before this icon, he had a magnificent locution. And he only remembered the tail end of it. And the priest there didn't know that he had this gift. And so they asked him to repeat it. And he said, I'm sorry, it's gone. But what he does recall, what they recalled, is Our Lady said to him, do you see with what spontaneity you gave all you had to my daughter Helen. Helen was the lady looking after them. It's the same way 
I give you graces. Isn't that a beautiful? Yeah. That's never recorded anywhere. Which brings me to another level. Many of the locutions are not published in this book. It is up to the discernment of his spiritual directors. Many of them have names of places and people and so forth, and they, with great discretion, never published, never published. But it, that is how it's been collated. The spirit, he, he received these messages. I had the privilege of being with him when he received them. And we were simply dining at, at a table. There was a bishop present and two priests. And he simply got up and he disappeared. We actually thought he went to the bathroom. But we had another session at two o'clock, a huge session. And I thought I'd better go looking for him because I couldn't, I, I thought maybe he wasn't feeling well. So I discreetly saw he wasn't in the bathroom. He was in an adjoining room and he simply got up and folded a very humble booklet, a writing pad, like an exercise pad. And that was the locution. So he gets. He was right in the middle of a meal almost, you know, in this, and he just excused himself. So what I'm saying is he obviously perceived that he was about to receive this locution, whether it comes as a, a you know, a signal personally to him. He synchronizes pen to paper, leaves it exactly as it is, submitted to the spiritual director, and here we have the pages developing. Always mentions the place where he is, often the fifth day and the date, as you know from reading the Blue Book. So as you comb through this, yes, there is a very strong prophetic side, but that's not the main reason Our Lady started the Mary Movement. She wanted this movement to make us understand that it was born in Fatima, all that she predicted in Fatima, that Russia would spread her errors throughout the world, the church would have much to suffer, and so on and so forth. Of course, we see it in the greater reality today. But I've never known or read any priest who has unpacked the book of Revelation, chapters 12 and 13 particularly, in the light of Father Gobi. No one, no great theologian has ever come near because it's not Father Gobi that's unpacked it. So when you start reading the symbolism of the dragon the woman clothed with the sun and so on and so forth. Our Lady has unpacked that in a very precise manner for us, almost verse for, you know, word for word. He had the privilege of meeting Sister Lucy herself in Fatima. He has had that privilege. And she said, you must become my voice piece within the world, which obviously is carried out very well. Um, then we started to understand not only the red dragon, atheistic Marxism. There was a second element in the locutions 405 and 406 and 407, particularly highlight the unpacking of Revelation and give rise to the Black Beast and Freemasonry. Now, I think prior to Father Gobby and the Mary Movement of Priest, we never, well, I certainly not in this country, ever heard any priest even mention Freemasonry, let alone ecclesiastical Freemasonry. It was unheard of. In fact, I would say the priests that may have a resistance to this movement, uh, part of the reason they may have this resistance is that they might be quietly shamed at all the tolerance that's gone on for decades that we are all friends and one of the same brotherhood. Let me tell you, we're far off that. There's been more encyclicals and popes that have screamed out about Freemasonry than we know of, but that's conveniently forgotten. And they justify it, very sadly. So the ecclesiastical masonry is probably the part that we are most interested in, particularly in these times that we're living. Because what it actually does, I mean, let me quote, Pope Benedict, who I hope they will make a saint one day. I absolutely love the writings of this Pope. He said, above all, the church must guarantee sacramental grace from the cross perennially till the end of time. That's its primary function. It doesn't matter if the church doesn't do any charity and doesn't open hospitals and doesn't open soup kitchen. That's a consequence 
of people who are imbued with the love of Jesus, we don't only pray, we serve, because that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We must pray and we must serve. But primarily, the church must guarantee this vehicle of sanctifying grace that is born perennially from the cross. Well, what ecclesiastical Freemasonry does, it cauterizes that. It throws out the sacramental aspect of the church and the sacraments, and it leaves us with a lot of empty shells with lovely labels on them. Labels like social justice and this and that. It looks good on the outside that we're doing all these things. But are we touching souls with sanctifying grace? So what Our Lady does in this book is she touches the nerve. She touches the very wounds of the church. There was a lot of misgivings in the year 2000, and I attended one of the retreats of Father Gobi at Colli Valenza. It was attended by 27 bishops and about 350 priests and a handful of lay people. He said in 1999, because I translated his retreat, don't think by the year 2000 you're going to wake up and have the triumph. Absolute nonsense. He made that very clear. He said, Our Lady will lance the boil. We cannot renew a church that is infected. If some of the locutions speak about the church covered in leprosy, that's one of the locutions, the depiction. And unless we, re we sponge out and throw out the unfortunate, disgraceful level of sin, that has plagued our church, it can never be renewed because it is the spouse of Jesus. And unfortunately, well, one of the elements that has first gone in our sacramental life, thank you to ecclesiastical Freemasonry, is the sacrament of reconciliation and confession or penance or whatever you call it in Ireland. That's what we call it here. And then she also describes that we're going to Holy Communion. It's like feeding a corpse some food. It's ineffective. It's not efficacious. So what Our Lady does there, she forms us, as I said, not in the prophetic sense, but on a daily basis to learn. You see, she gives a bird's eye point of view in this book of the world globally. We often see the world just in our little local parish or perhaps in our diocese. No, no, we have to move away from that. We have to start seeing the world through her eyes on a global level, on a huge global. So she becomes like a physician. She diagnoses correctly. But both the doctor and the healer and the medicine is her son, Jesus. But she's actually doing a diagnostic review of the malaise in the world on a social level, and on a spiritual level. And they're very correlated, there's no doubt. Where the book looked rather alarming in the prophetic sense, now it's started to look more of a roadmap to most of us, right? But we have to arrive at what it means to live consecrated totally with her. And Father Gobby was the least person he was very anti-private revelation. That was the kind of person he was. She had to pound him over the years and mortify him and humble him until he became the instrument she wanted. Uh, he speaks often of the consecration as a process of divesting as much as it is acquiring. And what he meant by divesting is that we are attached to so many things that are totally unnecessary. And he gave example of his own life. Wherever he was, when the final soccer or football, whatever you call it in Europe, the grand final was on, there's no way he would miss it. But after he became more and more acquainted with this work and called to this mission, it's not that he didn't like soccer anymore or football. He just didn't have the same passion for it. And he called her the lady with the golden scissors. And that's what happens to all of us. We might be very um, stuck on, you know, watching the final of the tennis or whatever our 
our passions are. But after a while, we find that those things don't attract us anymore. The things that really make it give us the greatest inner peace are the things connected with the Lord. She shows herself so close to us that you have to fall madly in love with Jesus. There's, there's no option because she's the original carrier. So one time, Father Gobby also gave the, the um, impression of uh, the old-fashioned photographs. Remember, we used to have the negatives and go back to the photographer and have them printed again. He said there's a lot of versions of Jesus floating around these days, maybe mm. something like three or 400 churches given us some version of Jesus. Go back to the original copy. The original copy is the Blessed Mother. And so this book has highlighted that. As you read it, you, th you never think of Father Gobby. He's, he's off the picture. Our Lady is directly speaking to you. And even if you read the same locution at another time, you'll read something different in it. There'll be a word there that touches you. There'll be a phrase that touches you. It's different. And that yeah. also depends on our surrendering, on our entrustment. So, Robert, that was a long answer. That's just <laughs> fascinating. It's fascinating, especially when you were there talking about the, the wound. I mean, it's it's age old you know how do we progress to know christ where we have to know sin confess sin and and let sanctifying grace then transform us it's the doctors of the church it's it, i mean you cannot go wrong with that um yes. you know conversion yes. of life it's it it i've studied this i've checked it out it's not and you're not just looking at private revelation here we're just looking at what the church did and today we have turned off the 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 sanctifying grace side you know in the in this in this in uh, we don't offer we don't offer this so how can people know and we've then we've told we haven't told them what sin is so you know we downplay pelvic sins or sin below the waist or you know there's this there's this you know we'll bless you and uh, and we're not we're not calling you guys come back to christ yeah. change your life and then because yes. we're not able to open them up to the door saying now they will see once once they will see what Christ starts to do in sanctifying grace. And um yeah. and it's that's not father, that's not a, a private revelation, what I'm saying here. That's the faith and and of the church. Exactly. Always has been. Yeah. And I but if people ex if people experience Christ's love when we give up our 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 idols of sin you know our attachments the experience it's it's transformative so i can understand why our lady is kind of using father Gobi to do that yes what i was getting yolanda when i started reading this book was the time scale you know we go back to 1972 and yes. to put people's put today's viewers in context this is 51 years okay. ago it's a year year before i was born um, you had tens of thousands of priests leaving the church at that time. Yes. And yes, so absolutely. you had this massive confusion. A lot yes. of people thought the church was going to do X, Y, and Z. There was going to be married priests. There was going to be this. You know, there was this big build up of expectation. And then we had Humanae Vitae and we had, uh, <laughs> and it did, yes. it, the expectations yes. didn't come to fruition as as the liberals yes. thought and we had this mass yes. exodus of priests and then you have father gobi coming along our lady bring and then you have this build up this kind of uh build up of uh, i just thought it was very prophetic it was well it was very interesting the timing um it, it's before akisha it's it's right in yes. there yes and he met he met sister agnes sagawaki with bishop ito there's a photo of father gobi with the um, the statue of Akita, which is in fact Our Lady of All Nations, which the Dutch priests brought to Japan. But you see, just to add to that confusion, Robert, you may or may not know, um, <clears throat> Bishop Ito was totally in favour. The messages went to then the Cardinal Ratzinger, and he said they are simply a copycat of Fatima, which is what this book is based on, telescope. The new bishop came and he exiled Sister. Agnes. She's in a non-Catholic age time 
in the wilderness, didn't accept it. The great tsunami came to Japan some years ago, if you remember, and many died. Well, oddly enough, the only thing around Akita was her, the chapel with those nuns, the Eucharistic nuns, that are still standing. Everything else was wiped out. It's, it's mind-boggling. This is what we have in the church at the moment. We have somebody that comes along and preaches this, and then somebody that comes along and undoes it. So what Our Lady is saying to us, this is why six months before Father Gobby died, and he, was, he died under Pope Benedict, he was at a, the lady and the gentleman that host him on the border of Italy and Switzerland. And Marina, my friend who's here with me at the moment, we were both there to witness what they told us. She said, I was preparing the meal. Father was quietly praying in the corner, saying his office. And then he looked up and he said, Rosalba, we're going to have two popes. And she actually dropped the kitchen knife. She was so shocked. And she said, Father Gobby, what on earth are you saying? Who on earth are we supposed to follow? And Father Gobby said, only Our Lady is going to guide you through these times. Well, that is so consoling to me because that's exactly what she's doing. There's no fear. Uh, the, the contradictions and the confusion. Confusion in the book here, there's two lines. I forget the, the number of it. Confusion comes from error, and error brings loss of faith. If there wasn't, if the truth was preached in the first place, there's no need for people to be confused. I've never had to reiterate anything of John Paul or of Pope Benedict. I'm covering. We pray. We love Pope Francis. We pray for him. I'm always undoing and redoing. So I go back and I say to people, you have Holy Scripture, you have the Catechism, an absolute jewel of the church, the Catechism, mm -hmm. and is. you have the Blue Book. Now, why are you confused? Where's the confusion? What is it going on in your heart and mind at the moment that you're confused? Why are you confused? And generally they come to that answer themselves. So there is great confusion and it's deliberate. I'm absolutely certain the confusion is deliberate to throw us off course. Because like Our Lady tells us in the book, it's an interesting correlation. I had the privilege of meeting Father Serafin Mikolinko from the Divine Mercy, one of the original founders of the shrine in America. And he stayed with me for over a week. And he told me that the community of Divine Mercy were the first that hosted Father Gobi in America. And living with him was Father George Kaziki. I think he's either died or he's got severe Alzheimer's, sadly, at the moment. And George Kaziki wrote a fascinating book. It's quite a number of years ago, ago called The Bride and the Spirit Say Come. It was a combination of Pope John Twenty Third having a vision of the new springtime in the church giving us a taste, possibly, of the new triumph to come. Okay, We perceive that already in our hearts. We look forward to this second Pentecost or the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, all one of the same thing. So many of the then the original charismatic renewal people had this great coming of the Holy Spirit, which they latched onto, which was fine. But then many got waylaid and got involved in many charismatic renewals that had nothing to do with the Catholic Church or John Paul's vision. And they certainly tossed Our Lady out and unfortunately the rosary that went with it, right? They had almost monopoly on the Holy Spirit. The rest of us were left by the wayside. And it's a magnificent book in that while it gives you a taste, and we can often taste this when we're with Our Lady, we can taste that she desires this triumph. It's, yes, it's coming. But before we arrive there, we have to emulate the life of Jesus. We have to go through the valley of suffering. We have to go through the same steps that we're going through this week in Holy Week until the summit of Calvary. And so Father George Kaziki then describes the Marian movement of priests 
embraced this valley until the summit. Make sense? Yes. When once we are on the cross at the Golgotha with Jesus, it looks as if the church has died. The church as we know it has to appear as if it's died. And Satan, it's at the back of the blue book, has to crown himself that he's the victor. He has to crown himself that he's won on every level. And just as he's crowded himself with triumph, the handmaid, the most humble of all creatures, snatches his territory. And I say to people, well, if it's going to happen now, he's only half humiliated. He's got to be totally humiliated. And so do we have to be totally humiliated. We have to die with what appears the church is dying with us. But Our Lady's developed this flock, this little flock. It's worldwide. I'm talking to you in this book. I'm in touch with other countries around the world. I can't begin to tell you, particularly Brazil, wonderful layman, all over the world, what we're saying to each other, they're also saying to each other. Yeah. The little remnant might seem little, but it's very potent because yeah. she is at, she is the leader of the cohort. We have to, she will lead and I say to people, don't be, don't be any fear, leave that alone. It doesn't come from God. But with a, a leader like we have, we have nothing to fear. What we have to do is let go, let God, and entrust everything to her. And that means all the wayward children, all those in the family that don't believe, it doesn't matter. She says in the locutions, one member of the family, one member, having cynicals, one member, is the lightning rod to protect that family. That must be very consoling because we're very blessed in Perth. There's a cenacle every day of the week somewhere mm. in Perth. And we have a very big cenacle every Tuesday with Mass. Wow. We only pray for, yeah, we only pray for priests, for the sanctification of priests. That day is set aside because if only she come, our lady's very clever. She makes us fall in love with the Eucharistic Jesus. And then we say, oh, well, I better pray for the priest. Because at the end of the day, the priest is responsible for five out of the seven sacraments. And no priest, no Jesus. Right? Yeah. So she's worked it out. I'll make them fall in love with Jesus. And then they'll have to pray for the priest. And that's what we surrender to now. So we have a Tuesday just for the priest, just for the priest. And I don't have to tell you how much need they have of that. Mm. But in the meanwhile, she's asked us to continually stay in the spirit of the upper room with the Holy Spirit, hence the invocation. Father God, we got that invocation in Tenerife in Spain. And, and repeatedly, come Holy Spirit through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your most beloved spouse. Where St. Grignan de Montfort is actually the real founder of the Mary movement of priests. Father Gobi speaks about that himself. He is the priest in time that brought that to fruition or tried to bring that to fruition. But if you read the works of de Montfort, and he tells you that where a soul sees Mary, the Holy Spirit flies to that soul. There's no separation here. It's, it's just... Marvelous concepts. Do you know what I mean? Father God is yeah. not capable of concepts. It's yeah. as it's come to him. And the way he preached was just, he was on fire with it because he was trained under that spirit. And we have to learn that same submission. She asks us in the spirit of a mother with a child on, on its lap. If a mother is talking to a child or reading to the child, the child doesn't have arguments with the mother and say, I don't like that, I don't do that. They simply trust the mother. They mm. trust that their mother is given the best dose possible. Well, that's what Our Lady wants us. That's how we have to read this book. Stop arguing with her. Stop putting up a resistance. How can this be possible? She's telling us very clearly. But there's nothing new that's not in the catechism. If she's telling us something new, it wouldn't be valid. Yeah. So I say to people, what's your problem, Father? Gloom and doom. Is it gloom and doom? Is it, does a physician diagnose an illness? Until that illness is diagnosed, you go through trauma. You have to know what it is, even the worst outcome. Once you know, she gives you the medicine. 
There's nothing Our Lady is telling us without giving us the recipe to cure it. And the recipe is simple. Yeah. It's the rosary, it's the Eucharist, and staying in a state of sanctifying grace. Well, what does the church tell us? The same thing. But it, I, I, I think I think the rosary, the Eucharist and sanctifying grace opened the door to this great conversation with Christ, you know, and, and she's really she's really taking people by the hand, you know, come and meet my son, come and meet my son. You know, she's bringing them into the house and she's saying, take off your dirty shoes. You know, did you ever take off your dirty shoes, wash your hands, uh, you know, kind of preparing the souls that well, that's how I see her. Uh, look, yeah. if you want to meet my son, sorry. Do you, I'm just giving the example here of what came came to my mind. Do you ever, when we used to live on a farm, and you'd be out working in the farm, and you'd be co totally covered in muck and dirt and everything, and then your mother would prepare you food at home. Well, before you'd go into the kitchen to eat the food because you're completely covered in dirt, she'd say, "Hold on a second, yeah. you need to go." Uh, don't even come into the house with the dirty sh shoes on. So you'd have to take all of that off. And then you'd probably have to go to a bathroom to take off all your dirty clothes because they'd be smelling and stuff. And then put on new clothes, wash yourself and then come in and sit down. And and that's really what Our Lady is doing. Is that look, you can't come in here to meet my son the way you are. You need right. to take off all that dirt. You need to get clean. You need to wash up. And that's really where the confession is. And there's simply no yeah. way a mother... There's simply no way, if it, and this is this, the truth of it, there's simply no way you can meet Christ with all of that. I'm not going to use a profane word, but people will get it. All of the stuff that we're covered in when we work in a farm, because it gets very dirty. You know, you're there, you're in the muck, you're in, you really smell. There's no yes, way you can yes. go in and have the meal with our Lord and sit down and have a conversation. You'd be embarrassed. Anyone would be embarrassed to actually do that. And and our best mother is saying, hold on a second, you're coming in to meet my son here in the house. Take off all of that. Go and clean yourself. Go and wash up. Now come in. And you actually feel better when you're cleaned and you've showered and you've prepared yourself and you're sitting down and you're having the conversation. You feel at ease yeah. and stuff. The world doesn't, our spiritual life isn't too dissimilar to, to what we experience in life. We have to change to to <laughs> to have this the, this conversation and i feel very sad that the spiritual nuggets of 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 purification yes. sanctification are lost in the church completely yes. lost no wonder our blessed mother is coming along to priests like father gobi and others saying guys you have lost you're trying to walk in and have a conversation with my son and you look terrible change yes. change the clothes she would yes. our blessed mother would do this in during in Nazareth if people were coming to meet to the house they, they wouldn't come looking d disgustingly dirty they would change they would clean up wash up uh clean yes. their hands and then have the meal yes. the church needs to get back to its basics it's exactly what you said what 20 minutes back in this interview our lady our lady is trying to purify the the, the rush the, the that's crept into the church Exactly. exactly. Uh, anyway. Now, we, we have other things that are backing this on another level. I've been um, very keen. I've been listening to Father Charles Murr and Robert Moynihan. Um, I speak to Father Charles, and he's written a number of books now, of course, has brought a lot of this highlight right to the surface, so to speak. But, I mean, there'll be others that won't like it. But... One of the things Our Lady says that once consecrated to her, including your children, once consecrated to her, they become her property. Now, Father Gobby left a mandate with me. You bring them to the consecration. It's up to Our Lady to clean them up. You can't do it. And I certainly know I can't do it. Well, that's the mandate. You bring them to the consecration, to the Immaculate Heart. She will do the rest. Now, how true is that? Yeah. Right? In our times. Once now, once that's happened, it's inevitable. I've seen so many phenomenal conversions, not just the story of Bruno Cromacula, many, many others. It is amazing once they have this conversion, they themselves find them the need to go to confession. 
sooner or later, it doesn't matter how dynamic the apparition has been, that moment with God has changed them interiorly, they have to go to confession. It is something that you are drawn to do. Our Lady gives you this kind of Catholic nose, if I could develop, if I could say it that way. You seem to be able to discern something almost right away. Something's not right here. Do you know what I mean? I listen yeah. to some of the Protestant evangelists and it's great what they're saying. There's something missing. There's something missing. I also found from experience a lot of priests that have great love for Our Lady have almost the presence of Our Lady with them. Now, I don't mean that in any effeminate way, quite the contrary. Uh, they have a great compassion. They have a sensitivity. Um, one of the retreats Father gave, I thought it was rather beautiful in describing the essence of love. I mean, to, in the English language, it's such an abused word, you know, love. So he explained, John Paul wrote this in one of his encyclicals first, there's different levels of love, you know, romantic love and this love. and uh, But he said, there's no greater love than mother and child. Maternal love is the highest ranking. In fact, Father Gobby said there'll be many more mothers than priests in heaven. Many have been purgatory still. He, he had a great sense of humour, by the way. That's the thing that attracted me the most, his great sense of humour. He was able to come back at you with humour, and it was wonderful. Um, so he gave this analogy that the priest, in his paternal representation, brought humanity back to the father. But in his maternal aspect, he was all merciful. That makes sense? Yes. He had to have a mother's heart to be able to bring through mercy to the father. And that was a beautiful analogy because that's exactly what I have found in the priests that really are more and more deeply with Our Lady. They have that maternal heart. Mm -hmm. They seem to understand that. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's mm -hmm. nothing to do with the genders or anything like that. Because the maternal heart, why? What's the secret of the maternal heart? It's all giving and all forgiving. Yeah. The last person in this life will be your mother that that does not stand with you. Unless there's something radically wrong in the formation, which can happen. But generally speaking, a mother's love is the last love that will leave a child. Every other love might fail you but a mother's love will be the last standing love. Mm -hmm. And that's what Our Lady is asking of all of us, that we look at humanity as she does from a bird's eye point of view. She can't give anything except love. She doesn't have any other ingredient in her to give to humanity. Once they've touched that, the, the saddest thing that I hear Protestants have a go at the Blessed Mother because you know, you idolise, craven images, all this rot that I have to put up with. They've never been touched by it. No. And another thing she beautifully says, that there's no atheist in the world. There's only those who have not been touched by her son's love. That is her version of atheism. Someone that's not been touched by her son's love. And how true is that? We've seen it over our own journey. We've seen it with many. And we've seen it in the least people we expected. You know, there's great conversions that are happening in our time. It's just absolutely stupendous. But conversions only come to individuals. The rest of us have to go through the journey of faith. God gives these great conversions like he did to St. Paul and everyone else, to the Brunos, to the Father Gobbies, etc. The rest of us have to walk through faith. Otherwise, you know, what's the point in having faith? right? They're just yeah. the highlights. And so Father Gobby has been one of those beacons, not Father Gobby. The instrumentality of Father Gobby, he's not important. Whether they canonize him, they've opened the cause, it doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. Father Gobby wouldn't even care about that. What he does care is that all of humanity enter into the Immaculate Heart, into the refuge. He'll take it from there. Follow the mother. Yeah.
it's fascinating it's a fascinating meditation you're really giving a really I, i'm i'm uh, you're de you're definitely making making uh people think uh, with this interview and uh i i really do i really do find it fascinating his 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 book um I just was reading one of the one of the the readings like um it rang very true to me and I suppose is there a is there a um a risk that we sensationalize a little bit out of context these messages or or how how are we supposed to bring them forward today into the church what are your thoughts on that because I know people uh, I I became very very uh well, I was, I was, I was very struck by what I was reading in the book when I picked it up in in Knock, uh, two weeks, nearly two weeks ago. I was very struck. I said, "How did I not read these before?" So, what what should we do? What 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 are your thoughts now on how we should bring these yeah. th this forward? In, yeah, I think in in life we're touched perhaps when we're ready, and um, you know you've heard the expression "the angel on the road." God gives us the angel on the road to help us. I think people have to be ready at one moment. For example, we have a great priest in Fiji, a, an Irishman from County Kerry, a Father Don McElwraith. He's responsible for Oceania and Australia for the Mary Movement. Every country has their responsibles. Our Lady's only leader, we're just responsibles. And he rejected this book outright. And many years ago, which you'll find fascinating, he was in Guadalupe with another Irishman. And as they were going up that huge round staircase, passing that wonderful icon of Guadalupe, the Irish priest said to him, well, Donald, it's a great time. Let's do our consecration. And he pulled out the blue book. Wow. From that moment on, he was a changed man. He had two people gave him the blue book. It collected dust for many years. But for some reason, that moment, not only did he change, he became responsible for the movement. So I say with people that want to, you know, when are they ready? We can give them the little prompts. Well, first of all, we've got to pray. It's Our Lady herself, ultimately, that touches. This book is not meant to be read cover to cover, by the way. It's not a book that you read as if you're reading, you know, yeah. Each message has its own local flavour at the time it was given, the epic in which it was given, and so on and so forth. But funnily enough, we, we have many spontaneous cynicals. We just open the book and we say, Mother, where do, where do you want me to read? And as we read the locution, it applies. Simple mm. as that. It seems to be very relevant. And say, wow, how come I didn't read that before? We weren't ready to hear it like that. It, it depends on the recipient. That's what I'm, I'm coming to. It depends on the giver to the recipient. And by the way, one of the good things I learned from Father Yozo Asoka in Medjugorje many years ago, he was not a priest that went from bed to altar, but not much in between initially. But when it happened, he put in a lot of preparation. And one of the talks he gave, he said, the devil is very clever in giving the word of God from the giver to the receiver and trust and twist in it midair. In other words, I may say, this is black and you've heard this is white. Now, I wasn't lying and nor were you. But we live in those times where this confusion can come in. And many a times, as I said, when people read the year 2000, I said, well, I never read that from Father Gobby. I heard him say it with my own ears. Oh, that's it then. That prophecy was wrong. Out with the blue book. What absolute nonsense. This is, how can I put it? It's a journey of faith. It's a journey where the Blessed Mother wants to take us. We're going to the heavy duty times now. Very heavy duty. She stood under that cross. Will we stay under the cross? We will if she holds us up. Without her, I'm not so sure. Maybe yeah. I only speak for myself. I'm not so sure I will stand under the cross without her. Yeah. And that's what I think. She's a real mother. She's intervened in the world everywhere to save her children. That's what mothers do. They give their life for their children. You know, they'll intervene to protect them. She says at Medjugorje, 
When I finish here with the Ten Secrets, I withdraw everywhere and we're left to our own devices. Perhaps we'll go through a metamorphosis of change. We will. The children said there, well, how does the world look at the end of it? They said, well, as in ancient times, they don't really know. Do we receive the gifts that Adam and Eve lost in the Garden of Eden? Maybe we do. Does it really matter? Because tomorrow you and I can both be facing our own judgment. Mm -hmm. What matters is that we go with confidence, with trust, knowing you have it in hand. So there's a lot of material put on WhatsApp at the moment and messages left, right and centre. It can be very confusing only to create fear and confusion. And I say to people, well, I think she's still appearing daily at Medjugorje. I'm not worried about anything. I think when she stops, we might tighten our belt. But you know what? We're in the blessed mother's heart. Let her lead. Let her lead. Let her carry us, our families, all those we've entrusted. So what I do at the end of the day, I entrust all those that I've met in the day and I consecrate them by proxy because they certainly a lot of them won't volunteer by proxy to the Immaculate Heart. Mother, I give them. I give you my children, my family, all those that I've met today, all those that I've driven past, I give them to you. You take over because we can't do it. It's too big for all of us. And Pope John Paul and his encyclical in the Rosary said, unless there is a divine intervention, humanity will not lift itself up from the depth in which it's descended. Word for word, wow. what John Paul wrote in that encyclical. It cannot without a divine intervention. And here we have the mother preparing us for that. Maybe it's a universal warning. Possibly it is. We don't have to wait for the warning. We do it today. We do that consecration now. We do it today. We can only encourage and witness with our own life, right? Mm. Witness with our own life. And don't show the stress. Don't show the fear. In fact, the joy that Mary gives, it's not a joy that you're laughing around, but it's a stillness. It's a peace that all is well. Mother has come home. Yeah. So I'm yeah. sure it's the same in Ireland. I'm sure you've got this underground that's working very hard, praying very hard. And on a superficial level, media level, my goodness, it looks like the yeah. devil's crowned itself a hundred times. Yeah. And it's the same in every country. It's the same in every country. But our blessed mother's very busy. She yeah. will show herself. And I hope I'm around for it. If I'm not, it doesn't matter. I just hope I'm with her anyway. And yeah. for some matter. Yeah. I it's I I totally agree. I I think I think the greatest place you will find Mary. I'm just throwing this out there, my own experience. The greatest place you find Mary is in confession. Does this make sense to people? Does, uh, it's like, it's like uh, she leads. It's like uh, walking into the confession. It's like our blessed mother leading you into to a sitting room where her son is sitting. And she's saying now, uh, and she she kind of she withdraws like, oh, I, where's your son? Well, he's in here, and she brings you in here, and but she doesn't want to disturb the conversation. Oh, you're there talking yeah. to my son. She's not there butting in, uh, kind yeah. of trying to overpower the conversation. She she's very I gentle. And it's it that, that, yeah. Going back to Father Gobi, one of the retreats, he said he wants to live and die as a two-month baby in the arms of Mary. Because as you grow and get heavier and heavier, she has to put you down. And then you smell, you know, babies dirty their diapers. And she says he needs a bath. He needs confession. Right? Yeah. That's how yeah. he, he That's one of his talks from the retreat. He mm -hmm. wants to remain a two-month baby who, who has to rely totally on the mother including changing the diapers, and that's the confession. We yeah. get too heavy and too big. It's true. It's true. Yeah. I mean, our ladies recommended monthly confession. Yeah. Well, most of us consecrated feel we have to go much more frequently than monthly because she gives you this natural disgust for sin, so yeah. to speak. You almost know I've gone too yeah. far. I need yeah. to bring this back and ask for God's mercy. And I hope that happens to everybody that reads this book. 
and I hope they're ready to receive it with that open spirit. That's all. I say, don't don't force it. Just it'll make sense when I got it. And by the way, from seventy two to seventy eight. Father Gobby wore his shoes off with locutions to his spiritual director, a very famous man in Italy. And he was more than prepared for the spiritual director to say, rip up these messages and throw them in the bin. Right? Mm. More than happy to do that because he was very anti-private revelation. And the spiritual director said, Father Gobby, there's a pattern that has developed here. This is no longer for you. This is for the world. Mm. And that's how I present it. Right? We weren't ready. We're ready. So we pray. We say, Mother, give me that nudge. Show me who you show the book to. But above all, bring them into a cynical. We we have to pray our way with this. This is only one component. Yeah. This component. And yeah. it's not praying to Mary, it's praying with Mary and the Holy yeah. Spirit. With Mary. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So that's yes. the only advice that's worked. It's been 40 years at it. It's For fascinating. Myself, I think we could expand out. I'd love you. You'll have to. You'll have to write write uh, write some more um chapters for for interviews, and we can we can segment out because it's. Yeah. I I really enjoy talking to you, and I'd let this go on for another hour, but I I I, I have to draw to a close. Um, yeah. it, it it's yeah. nearly it's Thank you. it's. But uh, I, Yolanda, thank. Please pray for Ireland and and ho have you been to Ireland uh, any time? Three times. Three times. I have a wonderful friend in Dublin, Mary Heavy. She organises the vigils at Knock, by the way. Okay. And, yes. And Deirdre Powell, who's in Sligo, with the most wonderful voice in the world, and she sings at Knock. Okay. So there you are. Okay. I hope you come across them one day. And the number of our, I mean, thank God for the Irish. They evangelized Australia. Thank yes. God for the Irish. I was blessed yeah. to meet so many of them. They've yes. gone to the Lord. They were the real uh, salt of the earth that came out. Do you know what yes. I mean? And I have yes. great empathy for those poor Irish nuns of priests that came to this bewildered country. I tell you, there was nothing here. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, their sacrifice, just even physically wearing those garments that they had to wear those dear nuns that came from ireland god help us but i'm yeah. sure the lord will reward them so we have much to thank the irish for in this country yeah. for our faith yeah. so i'll say it generically to you thank, thank ireland you. for me thank you thank you Robert. god bless thank you thank you come on bless